Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for again joining uh, the Medical Devices High Quality Screening uh, webinar series. Today, uh, our topic is uh, preparing assays for genome wide RNA screens using high content microscopy. Okay? Uh, and our guest speaker is Stephen uh, Brown from the University of Sheffield. Uh, this slide is for those that might be having uh, trouble um, with the WebEx. There's a technical support uh, call-in number, as well as um, uh, you can send questions by technical questions by Q&A, which I'll show you how to do in a, in a minute. Uh, the agenda is uh, um, uh, I'm going to do an introduction. I'm uh, Chris Chandy, the product manager for cellular imaging at Molecular Devices. Um, and I will do a short uh, overview of the Image Express high content screening systems. Then we will uh, pass it over to uh, Steve Brown um, to uh, give the bulk of the presentation. I'll take it back for a few moments to talk a little bit more about uh, our high content screening systems. And then uh, as we go, uh, please submit questions. And um, Jane Hesley is online as a Q&A moderator to uh, compile those questions and ask them of Steve or myself as appropriate. Uh, how do you do uh, Q&As? Um, there should be a, a Q&A button on the toolbar uh, at the top of your window. You can select that. Uh, type a question into uh, the type of question here box. Um, choose that that's where you type the question in. Uh, choose all panelists so that all the panelists can see your question and hit the send button. Okay, a little bit about high content applications. Now the devices pride ourselves on being able to handle applications from uh, A to Z, we like to say, from apoptosis to zebrafish. Uh, our customers are doing assays uh, with our systems from angiogenesis, orophagy, Cell pathway analysis, I think we're going to hear a little bit about that. Uh, cell viability, uh, membrane analysis, micronuclei, and genotoxicity analysis. Um, mitochondrial localization, stem cell assays, protein phosphorylation, and some people are even doing small animal assays with zebra fish or sea elegans. Okay. The, the ATS workflow is to acquire images with some type of uh, automated microscope. Uh, automatically identify objects of interest, uh, segment those objects, and, and then, and then make numerical, uh, turn those segmentation, those, turn those images into numeric data with multi-parametric data output. So this is a table, showing you a table with, uh, a bunch of numbers coming out of the system. And then be a way to make sense of all those numbers, and, uh, the, the final part of the ACS workflow is to you have to hit find, data mine, or maybe do some curve fitting uh, with your um, with the numerical data that you've generated with the system. Uh, the molecular device imaging solution comprises uh, a wide field system at the top left, the Image Express Micro, um, a confocal product, the Image Ultra. We can integrate third party imaging, uh, images from third party imaging systems. Uh, into all, all three of these can be integrated into a data management uh, solution called we call MDC Store. That's a place, that's a warehouse for your images and eventual measurements. The measurements come from the analysis tools we provide with MetaExpress and MetaExpress PowerCore software, which I'll talk about uh, towards the end of the, uh, the presentation, and hit selection with the QDX software. So, our tools are all integrated into one, one package from acquisition to the data management, image, image processing, and, and meta-analysis. You're going to hear a little bit about uh, some of these uh, aspects uh, of our product from uh, Steve Brown. Uh, Steve Brown actually started his uh, PhD working with, uh, with um, uh, tomato plants, but he quickly uh, uh, moved over to uh, doing some uh, work on embryonic tissue formation in the Sofla and migrated from there to uh, uh, doing signal, understanding signal transduction mechanisms in that model organism looking at the JAK-SATS pathway. 
Uh, Steve is now, um, since 2008, has been um, uh, managing the Sheffield RNI screening facility, a national screening resource for the software, um, and has lately migrated from uh, solely doing the software RNI screening to human SI RNI screening. Um, and uh, on that note, I would like to pass the presentation over to Steve. Um, Steve. Thank you, Grisha. I uh, hope you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you quite well. Good stuff. Right. Okay. Well, thank you for inviting me to give a talk on this uh, platform. Um, today I'd like to talk to you uh, about uh, preparing assays for genome-wide RNA ice cream uh, using our high-content microscopy system. Um, we're based here in the University of Sheffield, and the reason we're here is that the Wellcome Trust wanted a, uh, an RNAi uh, screening centre at this side of the, uh, of the big pond. So uh, in the States, you have the Harvard uh, Christopher RNAi screening centre, and, uh, and the Wellcome Trust decided that it was worthwhile for, for Britain to have one of these facilities. Uh, we actually do work for, for the UK, but we also had customers across from uh, Europe as well. Can you say I interrupt you? I'm not seeing your slides. Um, can you uh, share your application? Uh-huh, okay. Uh, oh. Does that work? Yes, I just, yep, I thought I'm done with you. Yep, there they go. I do apologize for the press one button. Okay. Um, so, um, this is it, my opening slide, and you can see uh, the contact details. Are, um, um, you can contact me by my email address, or you can find contact details on our, our web page. So, primarily, we're a, a, an RNAi screening centre for Drosophila. We act as a, a contact research organisation, um, primarily for academics. Um, and we've been running the Drosophila uh, RNAi screening centre since March 2010, although we've actually had three years of experience because we've been running it for local uh, screeners. Now, as part of our recent remit, we also function as a human SIRI, SIRNA screening facility. Uh, and we provide that for, for Yorkshire universities, and Yorkshire is sort of a, a county in the east side of England with about five uh, fairly large uh, universities, so um, um, we provide a service for those. Uh, one of the main issues that we have as a screening centre is that many of our uh, participants, our screeners, uh, don't have any expertise at all in automated equipment or high content analysis. So we uh, have to teach our, uh, our screeners how to sp uh, screen. So most of the screeners that come into the facility are either postdocs or PhD students, and we really try to get them up to speed as quick as possible so that they can actually uh, get on with their RNAi screens and uh, get some hardcore data out. So as part of our facility, we actually uh, help uh, our users also design and analyze their genome-wide RNAi screens. Uh, and that involves uh, some help with statistics and also uh, uh, design of uh, secondary analysis uh, experiments as well, which can be quite helpful and speed up the analysis process. Um, and as a little side um, a sort of a, 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 a um, uh, class, we also help um, uh, people um, uh, select their hits and actually manufacture um, double-stranded RNAs for them in the uh, Drosophila-based experiments. And I'll actually run through some of that technology uh, in a few slides' time. Now, quite a lot of people ask me, what's the advantages of using Drosophila and Melanogaster uh, as a model organism? Uh, well, primarily, uh, there's over 100 years of uh, genetic research associated with it. It's probably one of the best uh, annotated genome uh, uh, available. Uh, many uh, pieces of information about uh, uh, the, the genes in the genome, uh, which have actually been annotated by humans. Um, so I, I do have a, a lot of sort of issues with some of the, the uh, annotation that's available in the human genome, but the Drosophila genome is, is, is really quite robust in the way that it's annotated, uh, and, and you can find a lot of that information on Flybase. Um, now, having that information there is, is quite useful, but the real uh, uh, sort of uh, hook into the system is the fact that many of the genes are actually uh, conserved between humans 
and uh, uh, Drosophila, and, and in fact, quite a few of the uh, genes were actually identified in Drosophila uh, and C. elegans to, to a certain point. So it's fairly well recognized that, that, that a lot of people are using Drosophila as a model organism. Uh, in fact, we have screeners, and I know that Harvard facility also has screeners that, that come in and use Drosophila as a tool to identify genes, even if they're working on other organisms. And I'll talk about one particular screen that's been done today from a youth group. And probably finally on, on this, this um, uh, uh, overhead slide here is that it's incredibly cheap to make double-stranded RNA. Uh, you need a PCR fragment with, a, with some T7 RNA polymerase sites on the end of it, and you can generate um, double-stranded RNA very rapidly using an in vitro transcription kit. Within a few days, you can generate lots of probes. So it's relatively cheap to buy these kits and, and manufacture your own double-stranded RNA. Now, we primarily use uh, double-stranded RNA as a vector. And the reason we can do this in Drosophila is that Drosophila doesn't go through an interferon-type response. Uh, so the cells don't become sick if you add uh, double-stranded RNA to them, unlike mammalian cells. And the other main advantage of, of, of the Drosophila system is that you can actually uh, add the double-stranded RNA directly to the media that the cells are growing in. Uh, but all you need to do is actually just starve, eight, uh, starve them for an hour uh, before adding the double-stranded RNAs. And the cells will quite happily take up the double-stranded RNA, uh, go through dice cleavage and silencing. And normally that takes between 36 to 72 hours to, uh, to, to uh, induce uh, a good, good degree of knockdown. So, Sokka is a fairly robust uh, way of, uh, uh, of, of knocking down genes. And... Uh, a fairly cheap way. Now, to give you some idea of, 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 uh, of the scale of these things, there are over 100 genome-wide screens uh, have now been completed, many of them published, and primarily people have been looking at um, the major signaling pathways, cellular responses, and pretty much anything you can think of in uh, terms of cell biology has been done in, ter in terms of RNAi screens. Um, in terms of us, uh, we've done about 36 large-scale Drosophila screens, uh, including uh, 12 genome-wide screens in a fairly short space of time. Um, and we've got 16, currently 16 active groups uh, currently uh, uh, been through our facility. Uh, we've got nine customers um, keyed in for the, for the next year. Um, and now with our human SRNA facility opening up at the University of Sheffield, uh, we've currently got a couple of customers in and quite a few lined up for the next year as well. So we're slowly getting quite busy. However, one of the interesting things for us is that when we first started, about half of our screens were uh, lucifer luciferase or luminometry-based screens using plate readers. Um, generally, people would tag a, a transcription factor and, uh, with a, a firefly or an yellow luciferase and use that as an output uh, based on a plate reader. Uh, but gradually, as more people are sort of beginning to understand some of the capabilities of uh, high-content screen, uh, we've actually now got almost all of our screens that are currently going through uh, to high-content imaging screens. And I say 90% there because some of them are, uh, were designed uh, a, a while ago and it takes a bit of time sometimes to get screeners in and answering the facility. So generally, we try to work uh, with a sort of a flow of, 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 of information and ideas when we work with, uh, with our customers. Generally, the uh, PI or, or lead uh, postdoc or scientist in uh, the, uh, the host institute will come with an idea. Um, normally, that idea can be in a, 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 a 96 file format or even a, 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 an Eppendorf format. So people uh, would then need to um, scale up that idea into a, a 384 uh, screening platform. And that can take some time. Uh, the development of that assay can take anything between uh, a few weeks uh, up to nine months. So it's no mean task to actually to, to develop the assay correctly. Now, it's one of the uh, tools that we use for um, uh, developing this assay. We've made our own assay development plates. And the current uh, screening plate that we use for uh, the software is a, is a, a 384 well plate that has 90, uh, sorry, 60 kinases in triplicate. And on that plate also we have 95 uh, negative controls. So that 
when screeners start to use this plate, we can get an idea about what's the, the signal to noise uh, available for this particular assay. Most screeners uh, run a, uh, our test assay plates two, three, and ten times, uh, getting a feel for how well their assay is, tweaking their assay. If they're doing a high content imaging screen, of course, um, they'll uh, develop their algorithms uh, for actually uh, performing the segmentation on this plate. Um, once uh, they're happy with uh, the results that they're starting to get out, um, then we normally have a discussion about fitting them into the pipeline and getting them through the facility. And then once we're happy and they're happy with the, 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 the time scales, uh, our screeners normally go and uh, screen a small scale library, a subset library. Now, the one that we normally offer to them in the software uh, screening platform is the phosphatases and kinases as a package. And that package actually contains five screening plates uh, at 384 well format. Now, this gives the screeners some idea about uh, how long each plate is going to take if they're doing it in a high throughput and a high content context. So they can get an idea of timings and how well the assay is performing in a, in a high throughput environment using all of the equipment. And once they've uh, got the data from this, some screeners actually spend a bit of time analysing that data and, and creating uh, hits from, from that, those plates. Uh, and, uh, and other users are actually more interested in screening with the genome, uh, rapidly moving to a screen for the genome. So at that point, we get a lot of, uh, a, a, a lot of data back very quickly, and then the data analysis um, uh, uh, takes place. And I'll tell you about some of the little tricks that we use using um, uh, molecular devices in um, NDC store, and also some of the power core applications that we can use to speed up our analysis later on. Uh, uh -huh. Right, okay. So just to give you a brief background, uh, we actually manufacture our Drosophila RNAi uh, screening libraries. We use a Hamilton uh, high uh, sorry, a Hamilton high throughput robot, a Hamilton Star, to dispense our double stranded RNAs and our PCR products that we've generated for making our library. And these uh, uh, Libraries are all barcoded and they're stored in a minus 80 freezer, so we know which batch was made when uh, and which freezer it's stored in. And because we like to perform a sort of good librarian service as well, those libraries then have got Excel, spread, Excel spreadsheets associated with them. So our users could come in, look at an Excel spreadsheet, search for a barcode, and they know where the library's kept and the contents of those libraries. In the middle image here, you can actually see two genome-wide libraries that have just been taken out of a uh, minus 80 freezer. Uh, they're actually in a um, luciferate screening plate, uh, and there's two replicates there. And in the third uh, uh, image in, in the bottom here, uh, you can see our, uh, our, our freezer banks holding our, our uh, RNAi libraries. Now, for the screening process, um, this can actually take between, um, what a screener, a single replica can actually take between a few days to a few weeks, totally depending on the assay that, that people are, are using. Uh, and the left hand side of this imagery here, you can see the, the, the plates in, 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 in storage. Uh, we normally grow up cells in T75 glass, eight or nine T75 glass. Uh, will produce enough cells that we can actually seed them onto our uh, double-stranded RNA that's, uh, that's already been pre-printed and, and removed from our freezer. At this stage, people transect in uh, different plasmids for expression or uh, add different drugs or whatever the assay may be. Uh, three to eight days later, depending on the assay window, the process uh, uh, the, the, the next process is to actually uh, stain and wash the cells uh, and then uh, the data is acquired. Uh, and currently our facility, we have a plate reader and an image express micro, uh, high content microscope. So most people uh, uh, that don't work in high content labs don't really see this sort of kit, but I, I thought I'd show you, so it gives you some idea. So in the left uh, image here, we have a multi-drop uh, uh, um, bulk liquid handling robot. And this particular one, we, we normally uh, dispense our cells. So we put a flask of cells in here, and it dispenses cells, uh, 50 microliters of cells in every well 
across the three eight ball well plate. And to and to see the whole library would, would probably take about an hour just to go through uh, a, 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 a library in terms of seeding it and and uh, sealing the plates and then and then and then popping them back into the incubator. The right hand here, uh, 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 right hand. Uh, uh, image we have on the top here is our cell washer, and that we normally use that for aspirating media before we go to fixing the cells. And this is another bulk liquid handling unit here that we normally add antibodies or, or wash steps later on in the process. So the architecture of our Image Express Micro is represented on this slide. You can see on the top left image we have our Image Express Micro, and we also have a um, articulated robot connected to the Image Express Micro. And the Image Express Micro uh, will take between 20 minutes uh, and, and three hours, uh, 15 minutes to acquire a plane. But that really does depend on how many images, uh, which wavelengths, uh, um, um, you know, uh, which objectives as well you're using. So there's lots of different parameters that that, uh, that, that can uh, uh, change the acquisition time. Now, the Energy Express Micro is connected to a hub, uh, and uh, in our hub we have uh, a network attached storage uh, harboring our images. We also have an MDC store um, database that uh, harbors our um, metadata. Now, we like to think of our data in, in two ways. Uh, that, 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 that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's held on our MDC store database. The primary um, metadata is our good librarian part. It tells us where the images are stored and all the details about the images. And then as soon as we start doing segmentation and analysis and adding numbers to the images and, and actually um, calling you know, uh, RNAIs and genes as hits and things, that becomes our secondary uh, metadata. And attached to our hub, we've got, we actually currently run uh, four 27-inch um, uh, IMAX um, that are actually running Windows XP that, that, that samples both of these databases. And this is where our image uh, analysis uh, takes place. So here's a closer look at our Image Express Micro. You can see the, the uh, articulated robot here. And on an average screen, that would take about 10 days for us to um, uh, go through a, a, a genome. Although uh, we have had uh, other screens uh, that take uh, a day and a half, two days. It just depends on the, on the different um, um, type of analysis that are being done. Now, I've got sort of two stories um, to sort of introduce you to today. Um, both of them are slightly different, both involving high content microscopes. Um, these projects were roughly started at the same time, and both are actually very close to publication. Um, so this first project uh, that I'm going to discuss uh, has, uh, has been performed by uh, Pete Drake, who you can see here on the right-hand image, uh, who worked for uh, Edward Kepler uh, across in our, um, one of our departments here at the University of Sheffield. And their group is uh, a youth group uh, looking at the, the formation and maintenance of peroxisomes. And there are a number of human disorders that are related to um, uh, peroxisomes. Uh, however, there, uh, there are a small number of genes that are known to be involved in uh, peroxisome biogenesis uh, and maintenance. Um, but they're really interested in identifying uh, new uh, genes. Now, the, the interesting thing for me was that the, they're currently a yeast group working on the, uh, a human disorder, and they wanted to actually work on a higher organism, and they came to a Drosophila screening centre to, to uh, I investigate this, because they realised the power of uh, RNAi uh, uh, um, um, screens in, uh, in yeast. Now, they've actually used two approaches, and um, both approaches, um, although slightly different, uh, yielded very similar results using our high content microscope. Uh, the very first approach, they uh, um, created a, 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 a trans uh, they, they made a, a transfection experiment, transfecting in a GFP tagged uh, peroxidome localization um, um, peptide. So you can see here on the right hand image that you've got uh, cells that have acquired uh, the, the GFP through transfection. The unfortunate thing about Drosophila transfections, you normally get around about 30 to 
40% uh, optimal transfection. So it's relatively low compared to uh, mammalian system. And the degrees of um, um, uh, expression of the construct that you put in uh, can be quite varied. So the, the image acquisition and uh, analysis can be quite challenging if you're looking for a, a large amount of variation in the GFP expression you're getting from the transfection. So they've done one screen with a transfection-based experiment with that tag. They've also made a stable cell line using the same tag. And uh, the stable cell line, um, although um, more useful um, in, in terms of all of the cells expressing it, has inherent problems. Uh, there is a variability with the expression of the uh, construct, primarily because we can't work um, clonally from the Drosophila cells. So, um, yeah, again, you, you've got similar sort of problems that you have for transfection-based experiments. However, this is the sort of image that we would get back from uh, a 40x uh, image from a uh, 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 peroxidome-based experiment for the transfection. You can see here that there are um, cells that are um, clearly expressing huge amounts of GSP expression in the top left hand. Um, part of this image, and you can see that there are cells that are expressing no GFP because they haven't been transfected. So the challenge is with this particular assay is how to acquire um, all of the GFP ex expression from an image like this and actually use that for creating numbers. Now, when you do a knockout uh, experiment with one of their positive controls, one of the uh, uh, interesting things that you get are, are, are sort of patterns like this. And you can see that there are some cells that clearly have uh, um, unusual morphology because maybe the peroxisomes are, are, are not well formed and the, and the cells are suffering in that way. But you can clearly see that, that some of the GFP um, uh, uh, marker is actually from nuclear or, or pancytoplasmic. So it's quite varied uh, degree of knockdown. So their challenge was really to identify a uh, puncture of peroxisome GFP stained uh, areas and then, uh, and, then um, uh, and, uh, and uh, differentiate that between the wild type and the potential hits. So on the left here, we have another interesting uh, phenotype that, uh, that they observed. Um, you have this sort of clustering of the GFP in, in one particular localization cell. You can see on the right-hand panel that the uh, GFP expression is, is, is um, more spread out within the cytoplasm of the cells. And uh, on the left-hand panel, you can see there's definitely a clustering of, of the GFP. And those are the particular challenges that, that, that we've, uh, we've managed to overcome using the Image Express, uh, Meta Express uh, combination. So the way that we've been doing uh, a, a lot of uh, these screens are um, primarily with the application system. The application system actually provides us with a real strong um, a tool for our users. And I like this tool because I don't have to explain uh, uh, this tool to our users. It's very, very easy to use. We have a number of um, applications that we bought as modules from um, 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 molecular devices. And so this particular one, we're looking at uh, uh, the transfer application. The transfer application, we've, you can see here, it's selecting pits and vesicles. And we can uh, pull, uh, uh, identify the pits and vesicles from the GFP images. And we can pull the cells with the um, HERF stain that we've used in blue here. So you can see we can set the approximate minimum width, the maximum width of our peroxisomes. And then we can select the intensity above the local background. So if we wanted to, we could have actually selected vesicles as well, which would actually give us another size uh, exclusion um, uh, option. So this particular um, uh, application was very, very useful in identifying um, uh, our GFP pits in our peroxisomes uh, using our stable cell line. However, um, sometimes uh, life isn't that simple. And when they were doing the transaction-based experiments, the, 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 the group really wanted to identify uh, the number of peroxisomes per cell. However, if you've got a transfected uh, population of, of cells and you've only got 30 to 40% of them being transfected uh, and some cells without 
um, uh, the GFP. Clearly, you'll have a bias uh, towards not, you know, a, 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 a saying there are fewer peroxisomes to the amount of cells that are in your environment. So, the other, uh, the other um, uh, algorithm uh, writing device that we have is uh, journaling. And journaling uh, enables us to create some really sophisticated um, measuring uh, and, and segmentation devices. So, um, however, the, the main problem with our current journaling setup is that it's not as fast as our applications, and it takes a lot more uh, time and uh, experience to get one of these uh, these work, um, uh, uh, journals working. The, the, the really interesting thing is that you can actually um, mix and match uh, journals and applications, and of which our use, some of our users have become quite sophisticated in the way that they identify objects and do their analysis through this. And of course, once they've imaged their screen and they've acquired their, um, um, their, their data using the applications, all of this is stored on our MetaData Meta Express database. Uh, now, one of the essential things that we've actually found is that if a user writes an algorithm and they then discover a new phenotype that their algorithm couldn't uh, identify when they were first in the screen, they can then go back and rewrite a new algorithm and then rescreen the data because it's already stored on the metadata uh, database. So you have some screeners that have actually done multiple analyses of their genome-wide screens asking different questions depending on new phenotypes that they've identified from, from the genome-wide screens. Now, the sort of data that, that we can uh, 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 sort of access once we start using applications uh, can, uh, can obviously vary depending on the application that we're using. So you can see here on the left, you can tick different boxes for the sort of type of uh, data that you want to be read uh, uh, out of this, and, and then we can actually create Z scores on, on uh, different, uh, uh, different aspects that the users are, that are actually uh, interested in. So that gives us a lot of flexibility and a lot of power within, uh, within uh, high content screening. So I would sort of like to put this, uh, this slide up. Although it's not particularly a useful slide in terms of um, quality or, or even terms of content, it sort of helps sort of make our users realize that, that if you've got a, a sort of a general a DNA stain and you're looking at a large field of cells here on the top left, and you've done a very poor transfection, it doesn't matter if the transfection's actually worked uh, not very well, because you can actually see, uh, in our green GFP on the top right, you can actually see the, uh, the, the GFP positive cells. Then you can actually select those GFP positive cells, identify them as objects using our, our software, and then actually gather data, and, and then actually uh, uh, generate some really good crisp data that we, we can then work with later on. So that's sort of gives you an idea of, of some of the things that, that, that are going on, at least with that screen. Um, right. So there are obviously uh, benefits and, um, uh, and, uh, and problems uh, using uh, transfection over stable cell lines. Um, even though we've, we've, we've done an identical screen with two different uh, cell types, uh, uh, sorry, um, transfection versus stable cell type approach, uh, the overlap with genes is about 85% from the two screens. Um, so the current screen that they've done, they've now secondary tested these in Drosophila. Um, they've got current work that's now um, trying to work, uh, move forward with these genes in a human system. But they've got 30 robust genes that they're quite happily working on now and, and um, writing up the publication. Now, the second part of, of, of the uh, screen that I'd like to talk to you today about is um, we have another group uh, run by uh, Dr. Alex Whitworth here at, uh, in Biomedical Sciences at the University of Sheffield. And his particular group looks at Parkin uh, and Parkinson-related uh, disorders. And one of the things that they've uh, uh, really sort of interested in is actually the biology of some of the components uh, of, of the Parkinson pathway. Now, they know that the Parkin, uh, 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 equivalent gene Parkin2 in Drosophila has a very, very similar phenotype to uh, other um, um, Parkinson-related genes in Drosophila. And some of the phenotypes they get in vivo are uh, lack of crawling of the flies up tubes, 
uh, flights appears to be impaired in in Parkinson flies. Uh, So there's there's some real tangible phenotypes they can actually work with. And uh, and similar to the human condition, the the neurons um, become uh, degenerate and the mitochondria also uh, become dysfunctional as as the neurons undergo uh, the, the disease. Now, although some of the genetic uh, uh, linkage studies in uh, uh, some of the human uh, 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 sequencing centers have identified potential Parkinson-related uh, uh, genes, there is really a gulf in, in terms of how much we know about some of these uh, uh, the components of this pathway. So uh, Alex's group uh, um, um, decided to go ahead and, uh, and do uh, some uh, Parkinson-related screens. So one of the, 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 the easiest things to look for in, uh, in uh, these types of screens is actually mitochondria uh, and uh, the, the change in morph- mitochondrial morphology. However, um, the PhD student that was working with uh, Alex at the time uh, decided to, to actually look at the stress of the mitochondria themselves. And she decided to use a, a mitochondrial toxin um, to actually uh, uh, to induce uh, a translocation event with, within the parking. So what they've done is actually tagged the parking GFP, uh, with, sorry, tagged parking with GFP, and they've actually made a stable cell line. So this is an experiment where they've added uh, a CCCP, which, has, uh, which basically acts as a, a toxifying agent. And in a wild type situation, you can see on the top left image of the uh, 40x microscope um, uh, image here, the GFP is generally cytoplasmic, but as soon as you toxify them within a couple of hours, the parking GFP starts to translocate towards the mitochondria. So you get these ni- nice discrete puncture. And once you've got nice discrete puncture, the um, segmentation software uh, it, uh, comes into its own, you know, and we can actually uh, analyze them and, 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 and the, the, you know, the, the size, the intensity, and the number of these puncture within each cell. So it's, it's quite a sort of a, 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 a easily uh, a screenable phenotype. Now I'll talk to you about the assay first of all, because uh, at least it will give you some idea of, 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 of what it looks like before uh, prior to start talking about how we came to the assay. So generally in our facility, people take out the, uh, take out the double-stranded RNAs out of the freezer. In the morning, they're about to start screening. Pull them out, spin down the, the double-stranded RNAs, make sure they're ready to, uh, to have cells added to them. That the users will grow up their T75 tissue culture flasks, spray off or wash off the cells, uh, add it to the um, double-stranded RNA, and that's where most screens look fairly similar. Uh, um, in the case of Rachel's screen, she incubated uh, her uh, cells with the double-stranded RNAs for three days. Now, she had a copper-inducible uh, uh, GFP parking uh, construct in there, so she added copper to induce the, uh, uh, the promoter to activate the GFP transgene. Incubated for 16 hours, uh, then added a toxifying agent for two hours, and then fixed an image to cells. And I'll go through some of the, the steps that we've gone through to uh, get to this final assay. Now, so this is where this is the image that I showed you earlier. Now. If we um, change the objective size and, uh, 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 of acquiring these images, uh, uh, really you can't actually see the, um, the puncture that well using the 20 or the 10x. So really, we don't really have to start with the 40x objective. And I normally tell our screeners to actually start with the, the lowest powered objective so they can actually detect their objects. And the reason for that is you can actually acquire more cells and you actually have to do less, uh, you do less imaging time, so making it as fast as possible. The next uh, um, ingredient that she had to change was actually the, the ty- uh, to work out what's the next best type of toxifying agent. So you can see here that she tried on the, on the left panel uh, the type of toxin, uh, she tried a number of different types, there wasn't really that much between brands and the different companies. Um, and she went with the one that, that I, I suppose that she would have been using in the lab anyway, the, the Sigma uh, version. The toxification duration uh, appeared to have little difference in terms of significance between uh, two to, to six hours. Now, 
The reason she went to the two-hour uh, window is actually because two hours fits quite nicely into a screening day. If we were to extend the intoxication duration, um, it, it would mean that that, that, that that day would be much longer. And, and as you know, we're all human, you can understand that, that two hours is, is better than six hours in the lab, I suppose. Um, now, copper uh, concentration, uh, as you increase it, uh, the transgene would increase its expression. So, uh, Rachel tried a lot of inducible uh, different um, amounts of uh, uh, copper to, uh, uh, to induce the transgene. The reason that she uses a copper inducible transgene is when she first started to transfect in the PARC in GFP um, uh, to do actually transfection based experiments rather than using stable cell light, the PARC in GFP uh, with a long uh, expression uh, actually caused the cells to die. So she had to come up with an idea of, 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 about having a, an inducible um, transgene, and this fitted perfectly. So many uh, users actually use this copper inducible uh, expression system. Now she did experiment a little bit with a fixation method, and it turned out that, that formaldehyde actually pres uh, preserved the puncture within the uh, within the cells of the Parkin GFP. Well, one of the other challenges that, that Rachel came across is when you're doing high content uh, or sorry high throughput uh, experiments. Quite often, the high throughput machines that you're using to make your life easier sometimes make your life more difficult. And we realised that, that during the wash steps um, uh, at, at, the, at the final stages, the actual um, multi drop machine that we were using was actually washing the cells out. So you can see on the right hand panel here that you've actually got nine images per well. Uh, you can see the nine images here. And you can see actually in the, the top four here, well that, the, the cells are being washed off the plate by uh, the, the dispensing from the, uh, the multi-drop uh, dispensers. So Rachel had to, um, uh, we thought about uh, changing the um, image acquisition uh, positions for the Meta Express, which you can do, and that does help to a certain degree. Um, so she moved the positions of the actual images around the world. But the, the, the main uh, the thing that she realized was that if you actually change the dispense speed of the multi-drops, because we've got a, um, a machine that we can actually change the, uh, the speed of the dispense, uh, that seemed to uh, help her out uh, somewhat. Now, one of the main problems with, um, with the multi-drop machines is that they actually don't dispense in the same place in every well. So sometimes the, the ball spot would sort of move around the well depending if you're looking at the D row or, or the E row or the, the, the G row. So it's, it's, uh, it, it was sort of a bit haphazard to working out exactly where the, the bald spot was. We couldn't even image uh, um, uh, in a place where we knew we were constantly having cells. And of course, the more cells we have imaged, the better our statistics are at the end. So um, surprisingly, uh, uh, and we still haven't really worked out why this is the case, but uh, if you use slow dispense speeds uh, compared to fast dispense speeds, we actually got uh, higher numbers of um, dispense, uh, sorry, higher numbers of puncture with the drugs, uh, with the uh, toxicant, uh, toxicant uh, treatment from between the, the slow speed and the fast speed. Now, it could be that the actual fast speed is actually washing off the, the unhappy cells, but we really don't understand why, why, this, uh, why this happened. It's one of those unknown mysteries that's going through the facility. Now, cell number per well is a, is a critical thing because if, you're, if you have too many cells in a well, uh, you end up with cells sat on top of each other and it becomes very difficult. So every uh, screener that goes through our facility has to work out what's optimum for their screens. Now, uh, luckily for Rachel, I don't think the, uh, she had any differences at all between the amount of puncture from the 10,000 cells per well compared to 4,000 uh, um, cells per well. However, we've got um, cancer screeners going through or cell cycle screeners going through the facility, and cell number is critical to their assays. So this is a, a, a sort of a thing that we do with all of our assays to optimize the, the actual assay. And here's just a graphical representation of the actual number of puncture based on, uh, on different uh, seeding densities of the cells. Now, uh, 
Uh, an interesting thing that Rachel, uh, Rachel came up with a, a, a really interesting idea that I'd, I'd actually not thought about, uh, and she actually measured how many grey scales above the background uh, were important for our assay. And uh, you can see here that if you change the number of grey levels above the background, obviously 20 grey levels above the background, you're actually picking up more puncture uh, than you would do from 100 grey levels, but the question is, which one is better for actually for, for imaging and for getting good stats out? Well, quite interestingly, um, um, there the does appear to be uh, a sort of a curve associated with the amount of grayscale that you have above uh, background, and also the size of the puncture that you, you decide on. And although, you know, you get these nice curves and it looks as if something could be meaningful, actually there wasn't any statistical differences between the, the controls and, and the toxified uh, samples. So Rachel just went with the best gut feeling uh, after looking at all of this data and actually went for uh, 60 grail scales above background with a 0.6 to a 1 micron uh, puncture size. But I'm sure if we'd have run the assay again with some of these other different conditions, we might have got uh, slightly different results, um, uh, maybe on a very small number of genes. However, just to convince you that uh, that's not the case, um, I'll show you a slide in a few, in a few in the time that uh, uh, Rachel actually looked and, uh, and uh, uh, looked at that a bit more closely. Now, here's our genetic assay plate that we use in our, our, our screening centre. Um, generally, what we try to do is we try to uh, have our um, siRNAs pictured here in grey spread evenly across the plate. We have a no uh, siRNA or RNAi uh, control at the top left. We have, uh, in this case, we've used uh, a gene called DIAP1, which is actually a Drosophila inhibitor of apoptosis, one gene, and that acts as our positive transfection control. So if you knock out that gene, the cells die. And, and this uh, plate also, we have our stereotypical um, uh, columns 9 and 17 that we use for negative and positive controls, which are quite uh, essential. Now, our assay development plates, we use these 60 kinases in triplicate and our 94 uh, negative controls, and it gives our, our users sort of a robust uh, uh, idea of how well their, uh, their screen is. Now, first of all, uh, Rachel ran a, a, a phosphatome kinome and uh, uh, screen and she compared her 60 grey levels to 100 grey levels and this is the, the columns on the left on the right hand side of this actually did, uh, tell you how well all the differences are. So the only one differences in the top 36 uh, are the ones highlighted in white here. And of course you can see that some wells are coming up because they're empty and you think well why is an empty well with the, uh, no double stranded RNA coming up in this? Uh, well the reason is that quite often pipetting errors from our uh, robots or what HFX are uh, having an impact on this. And this is something that we would then um, uh, go through an analysis process after we've done the segmentation, got hit this, and then we would go through and clean up these from, from uh, getting rid of all these sorts of errors. And that can be a quite a useful sort of a, 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 a thing to do. Now, this is what the genome screen looks like. Now, uh, interestingly, uh, uh, batch number one, uh, highlighted in, uh, on the left-hand side of this, is it in, in red. Uh, batch number two is in the middle section, and batch number three. So one's in the morning, two's over lunch, three is in the afternoon. You can see here we've got that 53 plates, the plate number on the bottom. So you can obviously see there's sort of some sort of a, of a, a change uh, from morning to, to over lunch and then into the afternoon. Well, we don't know why some of these plates, uh, these box, whisker pots for each plate, so, sorry, the box is the 50% of the of, of the genes and the top and the bottom of the uh, the whisker parts, they're actually at a 95% confidence level. So some of these we have no idea why they're lower. It might be that the content of these uh, plates is different. Now Rachel thinks that she had a robot crash around about here, but actually we think probably the crash happened there. So we think that dispensing the toxicant, uh, toxicant happened to that, uh, on that particular plate. Um, she also noted, uh, uh, we get all of our screeners to do this, to actually note down what, um, uh, um, we make a screening log, uh, and that screening log is all the notes of everything that happened on the day, you know, if, you know, if, if the power went out or whatever, you know, everything gets noted. 
and that plate was dropped. Interestingly, the puncture number goes up when the plate is dropped. Um, but the plate, particularly on the end here, you can see that uh, half the plate had double the amount of copper, so that obviously increased the average number of punctures per cell um, uh, quite a bit. So the normal process is to go through is to uh, uh, present your data before normalisation, then after normalisation, uh, we have a, a, a plot here of all the Z scores, the screen, and you can see here the, uh, the, uh, the, the frequency of, of, of the hits uh, before and after uh, statistical normalisation. Now, if we were to make a heat map of the whole genome, you can obviously see that there are, there are, uh, 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 there are issues here. You can see that some of these plates have egg effects. You can also see that the top left-hand corner in this particular genome-wide screen didn't have uh, the toxic, uh, toxicant added to CCCP, so obviously these have low amount of puncture. You can see some of these plates here, uh, uh, and this is the one that we think had the, uh, the Hamilton-style robotic accident. Uh, you can see there's a quadrant-type effect on here. You can see some of the other plates down the bottom here also got uh, sort of lines across the rows. Well, we know those lines are generated through multi-drop errors. So there are things we can go through uh, and then sort of like manage the data accordingly so based on these screens. So currently, Rachel's got 30 genes that she's actually now uh, taken to a human system, and she's actually working on uh, those 30 genes. So just to summarize uh, 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 some of the things I've talked about today, um, generally, uh, one of our attitudes is that good screens have a lot of time spent developing the assay. The more time you spend on the assay, the better quality the screen is. Um, Users, we also strongly suggest to them to, to get to know their areas of variability uh, and, and the areas where there could be a problem. Um, we also make, uh, tell our screeners to make these um, log files. Uh, they make notes during the screens. Um, secondary assays are absolutely essential uh, so that you have another system or a follow-up type of validation experiment. Uh, in fact, every publication now would generally suggest that, that that happens before you publish because people can't publish RNA ice creams on their own now. And the other main problem with, uh, with RNA ice creams is that, that you will generate a lot of false positives. But the better you are at managing them using good statistics and, uh, and, and knowledge about some of the genes that are coming out, then you can actually uh, start streamlining your hit list. So here's just my acknowledgement slide. Um, I'd like to thank my uh, committee, Martin Zeidler, uh, he's the primary director of our facility. Uh, Alex Whitworth uh, and, his, and his PhD student Rachel with us uh, for giving me, uh, kindly giving me some, uh, some of the slides and data. Uh, Ethel Hetler and his PhD student uh, Peter Drake for some of the data that's gone into this, this, screen, uh, this um, uh, screening presentation, and also the SRSF personnel. And I'd like to also thank the Malaita Devices support team across here in the UK. have been very, very helpful. But at this stage, I think I should pass back across to maybe to Gerald or to Grisha, and uh, hopefully uh, we can carry on with the presentation through Grisha. Steve, thanks very much. Very nice uh, summary of doing RNA ice creams. Um, I'd like to spend about five minutes with everyone just to review some uh, improvements to uh, um, ACS platform at, at Moldev since uh, Steve uh, approached the system. Um, so, as I had mentioned, most of the data comes from the images of micro that um, Steve talked about, um, and you see that the, the, the screenshot here looks a little different than blue. We now have the uh, images of micro Excel system, which I'll give you a couple of slides on, and we've made some improvements to the MedExpress software. Um, now, give us two or three slides on that, and maybe you can think about the questions you want to ask Steve as I'm going through these slides. So, uh, w one of the big things, uh, you know, Steve had mentioned is you need to get enough cells for your statistics, and when we talk to most screening groups, they really want to capture many more cells, and they were doing that by capturing many fields, right? So, on the left is sort of the standard ATS system, which our older product was, was similar to, um, and that's a 4x image on a 3D4 world plate. So the green is the representation of how much of the field of view would capture with the, uh, with the prior system. Now, with the XL system, which has got this larger field of view, 
Um, you can, with a 4x object, you can capture a little bit over three times the area, which would actually encompass the whole well, whole thing for well. So, uh, at that, so that allows you to capture three times the number of objects. If you want to capture at low resolution, um, uh, 4x assays, you can get the whole well in one image. Um, and if you need to do um, higher magnification, you can capture less images for those larger objects. Additionally, the new system has a solid state light source, which allows uh, for on-demand illumination, uh, eliminates having to change the mechanical shutter, uh, if that fails, and then uh, you'd also have to change your light bulb. So, um, that was something that Colab were talking about, uh, making sure that the light source was always on. So, this is four, four changes to the image system. Uh, what does that larger field of view mean uh, in terms of numbers? So, uh, on the left, on the left column, you see what uh, a known assay is taking a standard uh, image, a standard system. Uh, you get about, in this example, you get about 120 cells in that field of view. Um, if you're doing a total output assay, you'd have a Z prime of 0.58 and an assay of 20. If you wanted to capture most of the well, you'd probably have to capture 50 images at uh, what this magnification is. The settings are on the bottom, uh, maybe uh, uh, 10x. At a 10x with a 96 volt plate. Um, on the right is what you would do with an XL. You'd probably get about 500 cells in that image. Uh, if you're looking at total output, your Z prime might improve because you'd actually, in a single image, capture more more, more cells. So Z prime is about 0.7. The assay window stayed about the same. And if you wanted to capture most of the well, you'd drop the number of uh, um, sites you need to acquire by a third, so 16. Uh, Association time for one site for this, this sub assay, but one site, not multiple sites, would be about four minutes for a 96 well, two color assay. Um, the systems are, uh, are fast, uh, give you some ideas across different, uh, uh, objectives, um, colors, and types of, uh, types of, uh, things. So high resolution, sort of receptor recycling transfer assay, um, you might have to do that with a 20x span AFO. On a 3D fold plate, it takes you 14 minutes to acquire two colors in the site. It's about a million, million cells an hour. Okay? The assay just showed in the previous slide, a neurotoxicity assay, 10x, 2x binning, two colors, 96 fold plate. Uh, I mentioned four minutes uh, a well. If you want to do something really low resolution, uh, uh, 4x, 2x binning, three color assay, 3D fold well plate, uh, 20 minutes for that. Once, it, once you're doing that, with that many cells, you're, you can acquire about 10 million cells an hour with the XL system. That's, that's very similar to the close cytometry speed and uh, allows you to look at uh, rare events uh, quite easily. Changes to the software side. So, um, as, as uh, Steve mentioned, MetaExpress is, is based on Metamorph, so we have all the features of Metamorph. So, you have the app modules for easy, easy assays. Those can be run through our, our PowerPoint module, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, you also have the capability of writing custom scripts for journals to do some of the complicated assays that Steve was talking about. And a new new tool is uh, um, um, something we call Custom Module Editor, which uh, uh, is the ability to create your custom modules, and I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. So we're going to run all of these different types of uh, biological assays. Um, uh, we, uh, I think that you talked about scoring cells, viability cell cycle, cancer identification. What's new with custom module editor is you're able to find objects inside objects. For example, you wouldn't necessarily need a uh, script or journal to do that as, as you did. You might create a, a custom module for that. And that's here we show finding uh, objects inside new items. That's also, so why, why would you go to custom, why would you want to add the capability to do custom modules? Um, you can now, with this tool, you can do some color and transmitted light segmentation and assays. Uh, you can, in, inside the modules that you create, create uh, more familiar classifiers of shape uh, analysis. Finding objects inside objects. Here I show a, a dot, a puncture inside a neurite. This could be inside a neurite, it could be inside transfected cells, it could be inside the nucleus. Um, you can simplify segmentation and measurement in order to cut down the number of segmentation steps. Um, that, that a module might use. You can report less data um, uh, to drive uh, analysis to be faster. 
And once a, once created, custom modules are like uh, our can modules. They can be shared, share with colleagues, and uh, we have a shared site. I'll, I'll put up. Um, I'll put up at the end. Uh, and additionally, they can be run in that Express Power Core software, uh, which I'll get to in after the, the, the next slide. Uh, the custom module editor uh, has a different interface from those who are already using the, the older Manic, Manic Express might be used to. Um, all the segmentation tools are available from the ribbon. Uh, they're grouped into four palettes for finding objects, creating segments based on application module objects, modifying objects, and modifying the image. Once you've created and put those steps into a, these cards, they're available to you on the left. Once you save them, you just need to go edit the, the field inside the module, um, much like you would with a CAN module. And lastly, uh, as you develop the module, you, you see a film strip on the bottom, and each, each step of your module corresponds to an image in that step. By clicking on that step, you can go back to that, that step card and modify that step card. So you can see what you're doing to the images as you create your module. So what type of assays does this enable? So here's an example of something actually created in meta, meta morph, right? It was uh, created with some uh, images off of a research microscope, um, and the person wanted to be able to do some membrane analysis. Okay, uh, so the the dark blue segment is the nuclei, the light blue is the full cell, and the yellow is looking at intensity in the membrane. Now, once this was created, this module uh, can be uh, saved and then uh, exported and then opened up into MetaExpress. So, it allows for cross sharing of um, Applications using Metamorph, MetaExpress, and then eventually into MetaExpress Power Core. Here's an example of being able to count unlabeled cells. So this is a phase transmit, uh, phase, phase image, uh, raw image, and this is the segmentation uh, that uh, was done on that image. So you might be able to do some, assays, some simple assays, counting assays that don't involve fragments. So what is, what is MetaExpress Power Core? It's a, it's a software option. Uh, that drives your analysis to be faster in acquisition. Uh, you basically, once you have a module, either custom or a CAN module, you can drive that across multiple cores of, 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 of computers. And on the right, you see the uh, time to generate a, um, analysis from a 3 opaque, and that time is driven down to be faster than acquisition. So examples of applications that now can be accelerated include the memory analysis I showed, constant analysis on compartments, so nucle uh, looking for dots inside nuclei, membrane, UI, colocalization assays, uh, labor fluid proliferation assays, wound healing assays, colorimetric staining, most morphometry assays. And this is just some examples um, it's about the creativity of the, of the end user. So the new MSSS Micro now is available with MetaSS 5. We drove it to alleviate many of the challenges found in screening environments. Uh, just running more screens, both with the larger field of view, the uptime of the of the light source, and um, uh, the flexibility of that app development to be run with um, Power Core. Uh, lots of ability to expand the applications, uh, making sure you can perform hit selection faster. Uh, with integrated heat maps and um, making sure that things can be run, uh, as the analysis can be run fast on acquisition. And we, we pride ourselves on making sure that we maintain high image quality with our system uh, and we made sure with the new product will be kept at that uh, high image quality. So on that very fast end, I would uh, ask Jane to um, look at those questions and uh, Ask, ask to you myself uh, what, what, you, what you have compiled. All right. Uh, this is Jane, and I know we're running out of time here, so I have a few questions, but I'll skip to the ones I think were, were not covered for sure. Um, somebody asked, have you looked at how much the RNAi molecules in your library give off-target effects, Stephen? Uh, we have... Um uh, so we have a library that is uh, an off-target uh, reduced library. So it's been bioinformatically uh, designed by Michael Boutros' lab in Germany. 
to prevent that target effects they've gone through and in silica design a library so that potentially it has uh, reduced off target effects. However, uh, it's very, very difficult to actually uh, confirm you know, a, a true off target effect library because once it's very expensive to do these, the RT PCRs and, 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 and all looking at the whole genome uh, changes for each probe that you use. So we have a library that we think is one of the best ones in the world by Michael Boutros, but uh, we, we have done a few experiments to try to identify if we do have any off target effects. And one of, we've just had a publication that we, we uh, 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 that, uh, um, that was published, and we had one gene that we uh, did identify that was enough an off target effect. So it, it, it's quite a difficult thing to uh, to nail down, really. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And uh, the example you showed, you had, uh, looks like, more than 50 3D four-wall plates. So one of the questions was, like, what's the size of the screen? But how much, um, how many double-stranded RNAs does that cover for a genome? Uh, so, so approximately we've got about 18,000 uh, double-stranded RNAs for that Cassopla uh, library. And some of those are multiple uh, RNAs. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't mention that. Um, so some of the genes that we've got in there have uh, quite a lot of sequence similarity to other genes. So we've actually made, we actually have multiple probes to some genes because we know that they have off-target effects. So the Drosophila genome is approximately 13,500 genes. So we've got 18,000 probes in that library, of which we've got over 20,000 wells worth of, uh, of, of material in there, obviously including all the controls. Great. And you also talked about um, people shifting from the luminescent uh, plate-based, uh, microplate reader-based assays to HCS, uh, probably because they're starting to understand, you know, what all they can get out of it, I suppose. And uh, I wondered, you said the people will sometimes revisit their images, reanalyze. Do they ever um, reread the plates? Do you save those plates? We, yes, we do actually. Uh, that, that's a sort of an interesting question because we've actually we've actually done that a few times. So uh, we've had two screeners that have actually uh, reread their plates, uh, but, but that changed some of the actual acquisition parameters. Uh, maybe they they cranked up the microscope to look for more more rare or obscure events. Uh, so we've actually had two screeners that have actually done that. The plates normally we put them. We've got a cold room. We pop them in there, and they last for about three months. So they're good for viewing within three months. Of course, uh, the fluorescence will die over those three, you know, that three-month period, and we'll have to crank up the uh, the, uh, the acquisition time a little bit, but not too much normally. Uh, they're normally quite good for, for a good three months. All right. I guess, yeah, because that would be convenient if they had identified some phenotype that they weren't exactly uh, targeting before or something like that. Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, and it, 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 screens are quite revealing because, if you don't, you know, most people do uh, observe new phenotypes uh, and yeah. they would never have guessed that was in that, that collection. Right. Well, I think that about covers our questions. I appreciate the, the talk a lot. It was very practical and really interesting. I'll hand it back to Grisha then. Yep. So, just to wrap up, um, uh, if you would like to um, get in touch with Steve Brown, uh, his emails at the top, as well as the the link to his um, RNAi uh, screening center. Uh, we'd love for you to stay in touch with both Steve and ourselves. Um, my email is there if you have any questions uh, that you would like to direct to me. Uh, we have, um, we participate every year in, the ATA, in ATA at in San Francisco, where we have our annual uh, ATA user meeting. Uh, we have a great list of speakers. I encourage you to look at our uh, uh, registration site, www www.device.com slash ATA2013. We've uh, focused on, we've got uh, five or six um, uh, end user speakers uh, ranging from uh, Pepsi to Regeneron to a couple of academic talks. Uh, if you want to learn more about our products, uh, please uh, uh, go to www.highthroughcutimaging.com. And I had mentioned very briefly <coughs> uh, a place to share journals and, and uh, custom modules. Uh, that's uh, a software forum we've created, and that, uh, that's metamorph.molecularevices.com slash forum. And it's a place to talk to other end users uh, about uh, generating custom analysis. So on that note, thank you very much for attending. 
Uh, Steve, thanks for participating. Um, and this uh, webinar will be available in uh, one to two weeks for uh, download, uh, download and viewing. Um,